Happy New Year. Welcome to the first episode of Pasadena Monthly, formerly known as NewsRap Local. I'm your host, Justin Chapman. Thanks for being here. It's a new year, a new day, and a new show. We have renamed the show following my appointment as District 6 Council Liaison and Field Representative to Pasadena City Council Member Steve Madison. Many thanks to Taka Suzuki, who served as District 6 Field Representative since Steve was first elected in 1999 for her service. I'm very excited to be in this new role and serve the constituents of District 6 in the City of Pasadena. The new show will be similar in format to News, News Wrap Local, featuring an inclusive exploration of city issues and an interview with a special guest from the community. After taking a look at what's been going on in Pasadena this past month, we'll speak with our guest, Councilmember Steve Madison, of course. But before we get started, let's check out these Pasadena media news briefs. The Pasadena City Council unanimously elected council members Felicia Williams and Steve Madison as vice mayors of the city of Pasadena on Monday, December 12th. Williams will serve as vice mayor from December 12, 2022 to December 11, 2023. And Madison will serve from December 11, 2023 to December 9, 2024. Citing the charter, Mayor Victor Gordo said the vice mayor will perform the duties of the mayor during the latter's absence or disability. Traditionally, the council elects a single vice mayor for a one-year term subsequently reappointing the same person for another term, and usually appoints the most senior member who has not previously served. The council deviated from this tradition, electing two council members to each serve a one-year term. Mayor Gordo noted that both Williams and Madison are highly qualified to serve as vice mayor. Williams and Madison thank all members of the council for the opportunity. Local journalist Justin Chapman has been appointed the new District 6 City Council Liaison. Chapman replaces longtime District 6 Liaison to Keiko Suzuki, who is retiring December 30th. Chapman, who was born and raised in the Pasadena and Altadena areas, is an award-winning journalist who previously worked for Michelson Philanthropies Pacific Council on International Policy and the USC Annenberg Center for Communication Leadership and Policy. At age 19, Chapman was elected to serve on the Altadena Town Council, becoming the youngest elected official in LA County. Currently, Chapman is the writer, host, and producer of Pasadena Media's local news talk show, News Wrap Local with Justin Chapman. Chapman's program will rebrand itself in January becoming Pasadena Monthly with Justin Chapman and feature inclusive exploration of city issues. On December 12th, Measure H rent control supporters celebrated on the steps of Pasadena City Hall after the Pasadena City Council adopted a resolution to certify the election results. The new city charter amendment provides rent control and protections against eviction. Measure H provisions become effective December 22nd just 10 days after the City Council's certification. A statement released by the City said, Measure H assigns powers and duties necessary to administer and enforce the provisions of the Charter Amendment to the Pasadena Rental Housing Board. Council member Jess Rivas told supporters, I was honored to be one of the early endorsers of the campaign and to work alongside residents to get out the vote. Measure H faced opposition from some of the largest corporate landlords in the country, including the California Apartment Association and the National and California Associations of Realtors, but passed with nearly 54% of the vote. District 7 Council Member Jason Lyons said, The Pasadena Fair and Equitable Housing Charter Amendment was approved by the voters and is the law of our city. Now begins the work of making the program a reality. For more information, go to Pasadena, the number four, rentcontrol.org. Let's turn next to our lightning round of news updates. The application period for the 710 Stub Working Group, called the Reconnecting Communities Task Force, is now open. The 13-member body of citizens will advise the City Council on the vision, transportation network, and future land use of the roughly 50 acres 
or 2.5 million square feet that Caltrans relinquished to the city of Pasadena last summer. At least two of those 13 members must be descendants of a Pasadena who was displaced by the freeway back in the 1960s and 70s. The city is also looking for people with professional and volunteer experience in urban design, planning, architecture, historic preservation, landscape architecture, transportation planning, open space, outdoor and childhood education, uh, development, economic development, real estate, finance, engineering, construction, housing, and community advocacy. It will likely be years before any new development or changes are made to that land. The community-led process to re-envision and reconnect West Pasadena begins now. Phases of the process will include appointing this working group, hiring a planning consultant, creating a financing plan, and extensive public outreach over the next several months. Then a vision plan and specific plan for the area will be conducted over the next couple of years. The city has established a new page on its website, cityofpasadena.net slash measure dash eight, to keep the community informed about the Pasadena Fair and Equitable Housing Charter Amendment, which is now Article 18 in the city charter. The webpage provides an update on the background and implementation of the Charter Amendment, responsibilities of the future Rental Housing Board, and the proposed appointment process for the board. The application period for the board began January 23rd. Prospective applicants must make an appointment with the city clerk by calling 626-744-4124 to apply. The board's first meeting will be held on or before May 17th. Meanwhile, the California Apartment Association has filed a lawsuit against the city, arguing that Measure H is an unlawful revision of, rather than a lawful amendment to, the city charter, among other objections. The city is required to continue implementing Measure H until and unless a court directs the city to stop doing so, which has not happened. The city and the California Apartment Association made an agreement last week in which an injunction hearing was removed from the court's calendar, and the appointment of the rental housing board members will not be made before April 17th or until the court rules on the merits of Measure H. The court will also fast track the hearing to March 28th. Last week, Chief Harris informed the City Council's Public Safety Committee that Pasadena has transitioned to a new crime data collection system known as the California Incident-Based Reporting System that will allow policymakers, law enforcement, and members of the public to have more detailed information, context, and specificity about crimes committed within Pasadena. The One Arroyo Foundation has completed the draft environmental assessment and report for the trail demonstration project, which is now being reviewed by city staff. The project has been divided into two phases. Phase one is the trail restoration and enhancement, and phase two will be making the Parker Mayberry Bridge directly underneath the Colorado Street Bridge accessible as a trail crossing over the creek. The One Arroyo Foundation anticipates beginning work on the trail in the coming weeks. Their goal is to raise $7 million to complete other demonstration projects throughout the Arroyo. Next month, longtime Pasadena resident and former customer communications director at Trader Joe's, Nikki High, is opening a new independent bookstore in Pasadena named Octavia's uh, uh, Bookshelf after Pasadena native and science fiction author Octavia Butler, whose papers are ar archived at the Huntington Library. Butler received the Hugo and Nebula Awards multiple times and became the first science fiction writer to receive a MacArthur Fellowship. The bookstore will focus on the work of BIPOC authors and will be located at 1361 North Hill Avenue. The grand opening will be held at 10 a.m. on February 18th. The grand opening of Landmark Theater in the Playhouse District took place yesterday, January 26th, in the former Lemley Playhouse 7 Theater, which originally opened in 1999. Landmark Theaters renovated the theater with comfortable reclining seats, a new concession stand, a full bar, outdoor patio seating, new projection equipment, and more. Development plans for that building at one point did not include a cinema, so it's good to see a movie theater back in that space. The City Council's Municipal Services Committee this week unanimously approved both a 10-year, uh, $188 million contract with the Southern California Public Power Authority for the purchase of geothermal energy and a resolution to declare a climate emergency and make Pasadena carbon-free by 2030, ahead of the st uh, state of California's mandate of 2045. The items will go before City Council next week. January 27th is the UN's International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Last weekend, members of the Pasadena community and local elected officials gathered on the steps of City Hall for the Jewish Federation's Every Person Has a Name, the 25-hour Holocaust commemoration and vigil that the City of Pasadena once again co-sponsored. Over that period of time, 136 community members read the names of 7,700 48 Jews who were murdered during the Holocaust to help keep their memory alive. Let's pass.
dispatch in our guest, Pasadena City Council member Steve Madison. Thank you so much for coming on the, the first episode of, of the new show. Thanks, Justin. It's great to be here. Councilmember Madison has represented District 6 in Pasadena since 1999. He has served as vice mayor and will do so again starting in December. He is a practicing trial lawyer and a partner with Quinn Emanuel Urquhart and Sullivan LLP in LA. He joined the firm after spending nine years as an assistant U.S. attorney. So, Councilmember, the, the, the biggest project uh, arguably facing District 6 and, and West Pasadena and, and the city for the foreseeable future will be what to do with the recently reclaimed uh, 710 stub. And the City Council, of course, by your motion, recently established an advisory working group of citizens to help develop that process. Uh, what, do you, what do you hope to see happen to that land? Well, thank you, Justin, for that question. I, I don't want to plunge right into the, the forward-looking uh, uh, thoughts without acknowledging what a tremendous uh, accomplishment this was for my office, for me personally, and really for all of the freeway fighters from Pasadena and beyond. Uh, when I took office uh, 23 years ago, uh, this was the top priority uh, of the council office for West Pasadena. Uh, we've been opposed to the freeway for decades. And finally, you know, last year our efforts paid off and we were able in June, finally, there were two big hearings. There was one in January, one in June. I testified at both of them before the California uh, Transportation Commission. And those efforts all bore fruit ultimately in, in uh, June when the commission decided to relinquish is the legal term that is used the property and to give us a check for $5 million on top of the uh, 50 acres or so that we've, we've received back. As you and your question point out now, that raises the issue, well, what do we do with it? You know, it's, uh, we've got it now, we've got it back. And uh, there have been efforts before, as you know, uh, the sort of reconnecting Pasadena project that really came out of my district uh, where many of the most active and knowledgeable stakeholders um, have, have lived for years. But I think now we wanna take this on as a citywide project and um, we'll start by appointing this commission um, the council members will each have an appointment or a nomination, but that I expect that the council will in fact uh, confirm whomever the council appoints. We have a couple of designees, for example, two members of the community whose families were impacted directly by the eminent domain some 60 years ago or so. And then um, the council and the mayor collectively will uh, appoint some additional individuals. So. That's a great start. For me, there are two other really important legs of the stool. The, the committee is one and lots of outreach and uh, heavy lifting, frankly, by that uh, committee. I've been telling the applicants that I've spoken with so far, you know, this is a uh, very labor intensive assignment that you're volunteering for and people need to have their eyes open about that. Mm -hmm. The other two legs of the stool would be strong staff leadership. Uh, and I've been a, an advocate in my regular meetings with the city manager and with other staff that we have to appoint one staff person at a senior level who has primary responsibility for this. This can't be something that six or eight different department heads or assistant department heads dabble in. Uh, and um, I've even suggested to the city manager that I certainly would strongly consider supporting a third assistant city manager position that we could fund and um, create to be able to deal with this from the staff perspective. We need to have somebody with whom the buck stops staff wise, who's on top of this 24 mm seven. -hmm. And then the third piece is the consultancy. You know, this is gonna be a, a novel experience for all of us to, from the ground up. And in fact, in the case of the trench, even below ground up, uh, develop, vision, uh, create, including infrastructure and all the rest, uh, a new community or appendage to the communities that are already there. So we need to have strong consultants. I yield to no one in my support of Dave Granis and his partner, Tony Harris. And uh, they really 
led us through the relinquishment process extremely adeptly. And so I'm expecting that we will definitely have uh, a continuing contract with, with Dave and Tony, and um, we'll need other consultants as well. We'll need environmental impact reports. We'll need development uh, assessments and valuations. Uh, I'm sure we'll need lawyers. You know, there's hardly anything we can do anymore without involving legal advice. So I think if we have those three pieces, uh, you know, firmly engaged and um, we work really hard, we'll have something great on our hands. But it's also something that could fail. Um, you know, this is not something we've done before. Um, really, very few cities other than those sort of out in the hinterlands that are brand new cities that are sort of just developing their, their basic city plan and infrastructure get a chance to do. And um, there are a lot of ways this could go wrong. So I'm gonna do my level best to make sure that, that we um, grab the gold ring as it were and have something really to be proud of. And then, and then another piece of it, of course, is the, the taking into account the, the residents who got displaced uh, at that time when the uh, first went in, right? Absolutely. You know, it's funny, my own personal interest in that started, the genesis of it was, I'm a huge Dodger fan, um, and I've read a lot, and I even have some uh, artistic uh, pieces, photographs, for example, uh, and books that uh, deal with the construction of Dodger Stadium. Mm -hmm. I think it was completed in uh, 62. I think the Dodgers started playing there. I have my dates right. And there were whole communities that were just bulldozed aside. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a tragedy. And I think so too, in this case, through eminent domain, the state came in and really pushed out of the way um, communities, including uh, communities of, of color, African-Americans, uh, Latinos, Asians, and not just residents. There were a lot of businesses that were mm -hmm minority owned and um, very important parts of our community. Now, you can't go back 70 years and find those uh, proprietors and residents, but I think what we can do is make amends in the way that we go about the uh, development of the, of the stump. And uh, I, I was glad that the council added the two uh, descendant sort of designations to the committee to make sure that their voice is heard about everything that we go forward. Right. And, and uh, uh, switching to, uh, to uh, rent control, um, uh, you were against Measure H last year, but now your approach is that since voters approved it, we should try to make it work. Is that right? And, and part of that includes setting up a rental housing board that's, that's going to work in good faith to implement it. Yeah, I wasn't against it um, so far. I just, uh, it had not been demonstrated to me that I should support it. So I think that's an important clarification. You know, I said in many meetings, I have um, yet to see even a left-leaning economist whose opinion is that uh, rent control uh, increases the availability of affordable housing for working families and others. But I voted to put it on the ballot. Uh, obviously, the, those requirements had been met. Um, and I was asked, for example, to oppose the measure in op-eds and uh, the like, and I declined to do that. I, I didn't think that was appropriate either. And it, it passed by a pretty strong margin. You know, in politics, 54-46 is a blowout. You know, in a basketball game, maybe not so much, but uh, so I think we're now obligated and, and committed to making it work uh, as best we can. We'll be forming a board, as you mentioned, and I'm looking at applications now for that as well. And uh, it's a complicated measure. There are a lot of moving parts to it. There are some major budget impacts from the measure, but I'm convinced that we can make it all work mm -hmm. if we all work together in good faith to do that. All right. And uh, you recently spearheaded an effort to, to name the City Hall Courtyard after Bill and Claire Bogard. Tell us about why that was important to do. Sure, you know, there are some issues on the city council with eight members, you know, eight, eight votes, um, seven district members and one uh, mayoral member, all of us having equal votes as, as council members where, you know, I say over my dead body to my colleagues and sometimes they say, you know, that can be arranged. 
<laughs> and uh, but on this one, I was really proud that almost the entire council came uh, around my proposal to honor this extraordinary couple in you know, some appropriate way. And, um, you know, I've done it in other instances too. We, um, some years ago now, we uh, christened the John and Barbara Crowley Trail uh, along Seiko in my district, uh, which was uh, an event attended by John and Barbara Crowley. And it was wonderful. We renamed after we renovated and retrofitted the La Loma Bridge, we re renamed it the John K. Vandy Camp Bridge. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, John had passed uh, by the time we were able to do that. But in this case, I mean, I've said frequently that if there's a Hall of Fame, you know, for Pasadenans going back to our beginning in 1886, uh, the Bogards would not only occupy uh, a place in that hall, but they would be in the Pantheon. I mean, they would be at the very top. When you look at the record of service by both Bill and Claire, you know, Bill, mayor of the city for 18 years, that's a substantial percentage of time of the entire lifespan. Uh, on the council for longer than that, the things that we accomplished under his leadership, Claire, her commitment to historic preservation, her involvement in organizations like Pasadena Heritage and West uh, Pasadena Residents Association. I mean, this is really uh, appropriately kind of the first couple of Pasadena. Initially, I started out wanting to look at the um, Centennial Square uh, mm -hmm. out you know, at Garfield and mm -hmm. uh, where sort of the Bennett plan, the center of the Bennett plan and all. And, but uh, through discussions and the like, the courtyard became a more apt locus of uh, some recognition of, of the Bogards. And I just couldn't be happier that we got it through council. We have, uh, you know, created and, and placed a plaque in the courtyard. So I want to recommend to all your viewers, you know, if you haven't done so yet, go to Bogard court Courtyard, look at the plaque, take a moment to appreciate the contributions of both Bill and Claire. And if you see them, as I did last night, I was at the speaker series uh, over at the Ambassador Auditorium and uh, was a couple of uh, feet away from Bill Bogart and his daughter Janine. Uh, it's just great that they get to experience it and be part of it. And, uh, you know, it, uh, it's appropriate and was a great event. And uh, the City Council will soon uh, consider an effort to make Pasadena carbon free by 2030. Do you support that? And why is that important? Well, obviously, I need to see what the uh, staff's recommendation is, and there have been a couple of different um, city groups that have weighed in on the issue. The Municipal Services Committee, as you well know, uh, dealt with this a couple of nights ago. The Environmental Advisory Commission, on from what I understand, was a motion by my appointee to the commission, uh, supported carbon-free. Apparently, uh, some of my colleagues were proponents of something called carbon neutral, which sounds uh, similar, but is not nearly um, the equal of carbon free. So I'm hoping that in fact, and if, as I know you did, you saw the council meeting on Monday, we had to push just to make sure that the carbon free resolution, the Pasadena 100, a really outstanding group of environmentalists here in the city, we had to push to make sure that was even before the MSC and then in turn the city council. And I, I was a little surprised to learn that it, it was not on the agenda and actually wasn't even part of the materials that had been posted until uh, mm -hmm. my friend and colleague council member, uh, Jess Rivas and I made a stink about it um, Monday night. And then later that evening, it was added to the agenda. And I understand that I haven't read the report yet, but I understand what's coming to us uh, when we get our agenda packet this evening will be something uh, much more akin to the, the carbon free proposal. And, you know, if I could, Justin, just to mm -hmm. kind of uh, as an aside on that, you know, we've had a lot of discussions recently where people have talked about, well, let's get along, you know, on the city council, well, let's mm -hmm. compliment one another. Uh, I probably in both senses of the word compliment uh, and collaborate together. And I think that's all great. And certainly the Pasadena way is to work respectfully with one another and uh, listen to one another and make sure all of those uh, in the city are heard. But there does come a time in this thing called governance where there will be conflict and differences, you know, and it's important 
that we uh, fight for what's important and for what's right and what our values are. And we can do that respectfully and appropriately. And I, Monday night, I think was, there were a couple of examples of that at Monday night's council meeting. So I'm super proud that we kept pushing and kept fighting for that because you know our kids and grandkids will thank us for that uh, in the future. Right, absolutely. Um, and uh, uh, Taka Suzuki was was your field rep for uh, you know the entire time uh, you've been on the council and uh, up until she retired at the end of, of last year. Uh, give us some reflections on on her service and 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 then uh, tell us about why you thought I, I would be a good fit for the the field rep role and what what you want to accomplish going forward. Of course. Well, Taka uh, is someone whom I met um, in my very first campaign for city council and. You know, running for office is eye-opening in many ways. You know, you you realize that some of your closest friends um, aren't all that interested in politics or service or campaigns, and then you realize there are folks that you hardly knew or thought you hardly knew who go the extra mile for you. And Taka was somebody who just worked tirelessly in my very first campaign, and then as I got to know her. I realized this is a, a person of tremendous substance and, and expertise. She retired young from uh, LA Unified, where she had been a teacher and principal administrator. And you know, when you think about a lot of the skills that a good district liaison has, can also be found in a great you know teacher or uh, school administrator. You know, dealing with uh, everyone from a uh, you know, a stubborn kindergartner to an angry grandparent, you know, who can't find parking on campus or something. Uh, and Taka just had all of those skills and was a tremendous uh, rep for the district uh, for all these years. And it was, you know, her decision to retire. She felt that um, she had uh, done what she came to do at the city. I certainly would second that. Mm -hmm. um, I joked that I would need to hire three people to replace her, you know, but fortunately for me, Justin, even though we're still sort of in the honeymoon period, I think uh, it was great that you were available because I had worked with you in your efforts uh, journalistically and also at WPRA mm -hmm. and, you know, come to see the thoughtfulness of, of your approach to things. And um, I think all of that has paid off already in terms of the policy uh, advice and counsel that you've provided to me. Uh, and we've got big policy questions coming down the pike. So the timing is really good. And, uh, and I know that also your, your masters in public diplomacy are serving you well as you arbit uh, disputes, you know, between neighbors and constituents on the one hand and staff on the other. And, uh, and you know, we, I've seen some big wins already in terms of constituent service and I'm, I'm grateful for that. So excited yeah. about about the future. And, mm -hmm. you know, if I could just again, another sort of riff or aside would be that it's a really interesting time on the Pasadena City Council. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got eight members, as I mentioned, as you know, um, it looks like as many as uh, six of those positions will be up for election in uh, next year. And, yeah. you know, I have to sort of pinch myself as I say, 2024 is next year, you know, we're now in 2023. And as we sit here today, we have four freshman council members of the eight. Uh, so we have two that were uh, just newly elected and then two who've just done two years, uh, one of whom had been appointed uh, Jess Rivas a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, uh, Felicia Williams, the current vice mayor, is running for the assembly. She doesn't have a free ride to do that, so she'll give up her council seat. Oh. Uh, there'll be a new council member in that seat. Um, there are rumors about Tyron Hampton also considering other, uh, uh, perhaps a race in that same, uh, you know, being a candidate in that. He has not told me that, and I've not heard that. Whereas I know Ms. Williams has formed a, a committee, which is, you know, a strong step mm -hmm. of, of running. Uh, so, you know, there could be as many as six uh, open seats on the city council. And of course, I have to make a decision about where I will fit into that. Mm -hmm. um, I think Mayor Gordo is, intends to run again. And, uh, and at the same time, apart from City Hall, we have... Uh, really all three of our representative, at least directly in part, 
representative legislative seats at the state and federal level opening up. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, both uh, Anthony Portantino, our state senator, and Chris Holden, my former colleague and our current assembly member, are termed out, so they have to give up their seats. Mm -hmm. And today, as I, I know you know, uh, my dear friend uh, Adam Schiff, who started the same day I did in the U.S. Attorney's Office mm -hmm. 100 years ago, and we remain very close friends and colleagues to this day, uh, announced what we had all hoped that he's running for the United States Senate. So each of those positions will in turn open up. And as I mentioned, some of our council colleagues are looking at those and, and there may be others as well. Mm -hmm. So what's the Chinese curse? Uh, you know, may you live in, in interesting times. Uh, yeah. Certainly we find ourselves in that situation. Yeah, it's gonna be, a, it's gonna be an interesting transitional period over the next, next couple of years. Sure. Um, and you know, I'd, be, I'd be derelict if I didn't mention uh, that we have a new police chief and a new head of the water and power and a new city manager also yeah. all, you know, getting settled in their, their positions and all. So it's an exciting time, yeah. you know, change can be hard, but, uh, you know, going back to, uh, the Chinese for a moment, the, uh, I understand the Chinese, um, symbol for risk is a combination of danger and opportunity. And I think we do have in these new positions and these new people uh, a ton of opportunity, just as we do with these projects like the 710 that we started with. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, a exciting time for the city and, and the region. And yeah, I'm I'm loving the uh the council liaison liaison job so far. Uh the you know, the, the best part being uh figuring out ways to help people and and how the city can help solve their problems. So really excited to be working with you on that. That's terrific. And that is that is the reason to do what both you and I do, you know, mm -hmm. is to help people. And to do that, uh, sometimes we have to sit through lots of long meetings that aren't always uh, scintillating, you know, in the moment and all. But at the end of it, just like the 710, again, come great things sometimes. And uh, that's super exciting. Yeah. Well, well, Council Member Madison, thank you uh, so much for, for coming on the show. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to speak with us about your work. I'm happy to do it, and I'm I'm looking forward to watching uh, your conversations with the other council members too. I think mm -hmm. we have a great council. It's uh, a lot of us because of the the newness of some of the members are still getting to know one another. Yeah, but I think each of them will have interesting and uh, important things to to share with you as you speak with them. Absolutely, looking forward to that. Before we go, here is this month in Pasadena history. It was this month in 1890 when Professor Charles Frederick Holder and the Valley Hunt Club began the Midwinter Festival featuring a procession of flower bedecked horses and carriages, followed by an afternoon of chariot races, jousting, foot races, and tug of war that eventually became the parade. The annual tradition was formally sponsored by the Tournament of Roses Association in 1898. Quote, in New York, people are buried in snow Holder said at a Valley Hunt Club meeting. Here, our flowers are blooming and our oranges are about to bear. Let's hold a festival to tell the world about our paradise. Thank you all so much for joining me for this first episode of Pasadena Monthly. Tune in every fourth Friday of the month at 5 p.m. Learn more at PasadenaMedia.org and JustinDouglasChapman.com. Drop me a line at jchapman at cityofpasadena.net. See you next time.